Okay, now about our esteemed guests for today. So today we have uh, Garrett Felber and Anup Mirpuri in conversation. So Garrett, who is the author of the book we'll be discussing, is a lead organizer of the Making and Unmaking Mass Incarceration Conference at the University of Mississippi. And that occurred in 2019. And it was an amazing conference that a few of our members actually attended. Uh, he is also a co-founder of our Critical Resistance Portland movement partner, Liberation Literacy, and a friend of CR's in the American Studies Association Critical Prison Studies Caucus. And we couldn't be happier to celebrate the release of this new book. Um, so yeah, very exciting. And Garrett is going to be joined in conversation today by Anup Mirpuri, who is the Associate Professor of English and Affiliate Faculty in the Black Studies Department and the School of Gender, Race, and Nations at Portland State University. So this conversation is going to highlight the legacy of anti-carceral frameworks and its implication on the development of abolitionist movements. So as I noted, I'm going to be moderator for today because unfortunately our CR Portland moderator had family situation come up, but um, yeah, I'll be filling in this evening. So Garrett and Anoop are going to share a little bit about their work, have a conversation with each other and um, with CR, and then we will hold time for an audience Q&A so as, um, as Garrett and Anoop dig into the work that they've done and bring their analysis, you can also start thinking about questions that you'd like to pose to them during that Q&A. With all that said, I am happy to introduce Garrett to share context and insights from the book. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Garrett. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Um... It's really an honor to to be able to do this event. I was I was really excited about it um, when I was out in Portland, and glad that we could make this work. Um, and thank you everyone for putting up with one more Zoom meeting. Um, I appreciate that. So um, also, it's just an honor to. I mean, my sort of introduction to abolition work, um, as Shirley mentioned, was in in Portland, Oregon, um, with the the co-founding of Liberation Literacy in 2016. That was also around the time um, that Anoop and I met, so it's just all around pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to try and make this screen share work and show some slides to get my face off the screen as I talk about the book. Um, so feel free to holler in the chat function if something stops working. That's my paranoia. Um, so one of the things um, that I, I like to do to begin kind of talking about the book, um, which is hokey and then is also on top of hokey going to be weird in this format because no one can respond. But um, because this book is really thinking about the nation of Islam in the context of the civil rights era, I like to start by just thinking about um, kind of fr free form, free thought. What are the people, places, um, time periods that come to mind when I say the civil rights era? So if you could just take a second and kind of think about um, what are the images that come to mind, the typical um, activists of the civil rights era? Where are they? Are they in the North, the South? What are they fighting for? And kind of hold those in your mind as, as I talk a little bit about this project, um, in particular, the opening two anecdotes. So I'm sharing this slide just to show you the, the chapter outline of the book, because I'm going to be, for the most part, talking about chapter two, Shades of Mississippi, which really um, is kind of the heart of the anti-prison work that the Nation of Islam does in the 50s and 60s. So keeping that um, question in mind. Um, so both of these anecdotes come from 1962 in California. Um, the first is April 1962, two black men are unloading suits out of the back of a Buick in South Central Los Angeles in front of the mosque there. Um, two white police officers stop them thinking or claiming that they thought that the suits were stolen. Um, what sort of happens after that is um, very much um, contentious and between two sides. The Los Angeles Times calls the ensuing um, altercation a riot, um, but in the end, um, none of the Muslim men were armed. Seven of them were shot 
by Los Angeles police. One of them, William X. Rogers, who you see here in the wheelchair, was paralyzed for life. An officer was shot and killed at close range while walking towards um, a white police officer with his hands raised in prayer. Several of the men who were um, on the ground shot and bleeding were handcuffed and chanted Allahu Akbar. Um, the second event is later that year in 1962, and it was at Folsom Prison. And these photographs that I'm sharing were taken by a prison guard who was surveilling uh, a Nation of Islam meeting in the yard. And you can kind of see the men um, by the fence sort of standing at sentry around a picnic table. And what happened was as this prison guard was taking these photos and getting closer, the men noticed that they were under surveillance. And one of them suggested, well, if they want to take our picture, let's give them a good one. And they stood, faced the east, and prayed. So these are the two scenes that I start the book with. Um, and to go back to that original question that I that I posed of sort of where, what are the people, places, and things that we associate with the civil rights era? Um, one of the kind of driving questions that I had with this book is, um, do we think about incarcerated people when we think about the civil rights movement? Do we think of Muslims? And do we think of black nationalists? Um, because those are three sort of sets of political actors, and in this case, intersecting, um, that I think often get kind of marginalized from that story, at least prior to the black power era of the late 60s. Um, so in both of these cases, too, we see um, essentially Muslim men responding to state surveillance and police violence with nonviolent resistance in the form of prayer. So my, my kind of open question with this book was where do these stories fit um, in our narratives of the civil rights movement? Um, so I'm going to basically just take us through the anti-prison organizing of the Nation of Islam through a single letter um, that that I worked through. I came across it in 2014 in Malcolm X's personal papers. Um, and it spent, I, I took about five years kind of untangling what was there. Um, this picture that I'm showing you, I apologize that it's a mugshot. This is the only photograph I have who the letter was from. So Bratcher wrote this letter in late 1961 to Malcolm X. Um, and he was incarcerated at the time at Attica prison. So this is a decade before the Attica uprising that you're probably more familiar with. Um, and I, I sort of type out some of the um, passages that I'm gonna be talking about because I don't expect you to actually read this cursive photocopy of microfilm here. Um, but I did wanna share what the document looks like. So when Bratcher writes to Malcolm in 1961, um, he's actually incredibly optimistic saying that the grace of Allah has been upon the Muslims in New York state correction system, giving them several openings in federal courts across the country so that we may seek redress from those in state and federal authority. Um, you can see here he talks about being persecuted, beaten, mentally, physically put in isolation, segregation, solitary confinement for five years. Um, but now our fight has almost come to an end. Victory is now in sight. So part of the reason that he, to, to sort of understand the um, optimism of Bratcher writing this letter to Malcolm X in 1961, um, we have to understand basically 100 years of history in which incarcerated people were not considered um, to have constitutional rights. So beginning in 1871, rough and be Commonwealth, incarcerated people are literally defined as slaves of the state. Um, and this period, essentially from 1871 until the mid 1960s, um, is referred to as the hands-off era. And this is a period, so we, we often think about sort of challenging um, the, the inf, inf, um, transgression of constitutional rights for incarcerated people. And this was a period where that idea, that very idea that incarcerated people even had constitutional rights was um, not a question. So during that hands-off era, the, the judicial branch essentially said that issues of um, prisons and security were the corrections branch. And there was no reason that the judicial branch should weigh in on issues of security and rights for incarcerated people. Um, so the three sort of things that um, in the late 50s leading up to this case that Bratcher is talking about, um, that incarcerated Muslims are asking for, um, one was access to translations of the Quran that were in Arabic. So they had um, 
English translations, but not ones that were English and Arabic. And part of the reason, um, as you can probably imagine if you've done anti-prison work, that they did not want people having English to Arabic translations is that they worried about people writing in Arabic as code, which in fact they were doing at the end of this letter. Um, he, he tells Malcolm to sort of respond in code through Arabic. Um, the second thing that they were asking for is, is literally this exact thing, which was correspondence to ministers. So prisons, especially in New York, had been denying the right to write to anyone who was formerly incarcerated. So writing to someone like Malcolm X was uh, an infraction. Because he had to and um, the last piece was access to Black newspapers. Um, prior to the sort of official start of Muhammad Speaks, the Nation of Islam's paper, um, the way that incarcerated people would build, or incarcerated Muslims would build their lessons was through Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad's editorials um, in, in the Amsterdam News, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Los Angeles Herald Dispatch, and other Black newspapers. So they were forbidden for actu to actually um, subscribe to those newspapers. So those were the things that they were asking for in federal courts um, or in state, state courts. Um, but what it also, you see this kind of reference here to solitary confinement, what was happening was in, in trying to access those things, they were being put in solitary confinement and they were losing good time. And the state, as it does today, was using those two things at once to punish people in multiple directions. So for example, Bratcher joined a hunger strike at some point to protest another uh, Muslim brother being put in solitary. He received 60 days of lost good time. So good time earned time was a way that you could shorten your sentence. And then once you were put in solitary confinement, you would lose days for, for each day that you were in solitary. So one day in solitary meant you'd lose three days of good time. And then you also could not regain time until you got back in general population. So the, the prisons had sort of used this, this dual system of um, solitary confinement and good time to punish um, Muslims in particular in two directions at once. Um, so this is one of the rare sort of photographs from this trial, which is the Sumerian B. McGinnis trial in 1962 that, that uh, Bratcher is writing about. And this is one of the plaintiffs holding this um, package of materials here, Joseph McGetty. And the reason I show this is not just to show you how much uh, legal material there was, but they documented meticulously all of the action, they lost the time, everything. So that's part of the way that I sort of was able to excavate, excavate what was happening was through their, their diary accounts and their testimony at trial of each time that they lost good time, each time they were put in solitary. Um, so this is from a later part in the letter. Um, and Bratcher is basically talking about how they've compounded all of this evidence for several years to bring this case against the state commissioner and the warden of Attica, um, calling 20 Muslims as witnesses from every major prison in the state um, to sort of be coalesced into this one trial. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because in these early cases that they brought um, prior to Samarian v. McGinnis, they were just litigating issues like access to the Quran. So that by the time they get to trial, essentially the judge says, you can imagine what prison officials did. They made sure that by the time they got to trial, they actually did have access to the Quran. So the judge says, well, there's nothing left here to litigate. And when the plaintiffs start raising things like solitary confinement and good time practices, the judge says, well, that's not actually something that I can litigate because it's not in the writ. So he does sort of give them an opening, which he says, you know, if you really wanted to change the rules of the prison, you shouldn't sue the warden because the warden doesn't make the rules, the state commissioner does. So there's sort of this period of um, trying new strategies throughout the late 1950s, early into the 60s, where two things happen. There's a widening of the scope of the trial to include persecution for religion, as well as access to the Quran and to black newspapers. And there's a widening of who's being charged so, um, or sued. So it's not just the warden, it's eventually the state commissioner and then the governor. Um, and the other piece of this letter that I wanted to bring your attention to is he talks about um, being held in solitary confinement with um, Brother Sastre X, Samarian X. Um, so at the time, I didn't know who Martin X Sastre was. I sort of looked up. Um, um, Again, there aren't very many photos of, of Sastre either. This is a portrait painted by one of his um, political comrades. Um, 
later in life. So Sastre actually becomes this really well-known um, political prisoner in the late 1960s, early 1970s. By that point, he gets out in 64, starts an Afro-Asian bookstore um, in Buffalo, New York. And he has this whole sort of political, um, second political life that's much better known in the late 60s, early 70s as a political prisoner who's eventually has his sentence commuted um, by Governor Kerry in 1975. But during this earlier period, he's what he would come to describe as a politicized prisoner, where he converted to the Nation of Islam, um, became politicized around these issues, and he was also a, a, a jailhouse lawyer, who's the one, he is the one who's writing all of these cases that are being compounded um, into a big trial. And what he would do is he would write exactly the same writ and then give them to people to write their name onto. So there's all these ways in which the state is sort of um, cracking down on this. They develop a rule where you can't have legal materials that are not your own in your cell. Um, and that's a disciplinary infraction that's specifically targeted at jailhouse lawyers who are writing writs on behalf of other people. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out about Sastre is he's not just a jailhouse lawyer sort of using prison litigation, um, but he's also using direct action um, and nonviolent resistance. So one of the things, because you see the use of solitary confinement as a way to break up organizing inside, um, he suggests that they take over solitary confinement, that they commit um, on purpose infractions which are designed to put them in solitary confinement. And what I think is interesting about this is in part, what I point out in the book is that he starts this um, idea about taking over solitary at about the same time that the jail no bail strategy in the South um, also gets going in South Carolina and later in Georgia. And one of these, if you're familiar with jail no bail, has its sort of um, place in the annals of civil rights history as the strategy of, you know, instead of posting bail and losing money over and over, and over just getting arrested and arrested, taking the, the mechanism of repression, you know, the jail and filling it until it's no longer effective. And that's what Sastre is talking about with the sort of jail within the prison, which is solitary. He says the box, once the box, um, you know, breaks down, the whole system um, follows because that's the central mechanism of repression. Um, so the third part of this that I wanted to um, bring our attention to in this letter is that Bratcher, as he's anticipating the trial, he basically knows already exactly what the state's argument is going to be about the nature of Islam. Um, he says that his main argument is going to be presenting certain publications from books, magazines, papers about the Muslims to justify the violation of our constitutional rights by saying we preach hate and we are a fanatical group not recognized by the rest of the Muslim world. Um, and he's absolutely right. So this is the, the sort of key argument of the state throughout this period about the nation of Islam. And you might, whether or not you agree with this, you might be familiar with this argument because it's, it still persists to this day. This idea that the nation of Islam is, is outside the bounds of Orthodox Islam and that it's somehow an example of reverse racism or um, some sort of form of, of hate, right? And, and this has a very specific um, historical origin story. And that's this documentary in 1959 called The Hate That Hate Produced. Um, so this is a six part mini series you might recognize here seated in the middle Mike Wallace before 60 minutes fame um, and Lou Lomax uh, seated on the left is the black journalist who sort of um, pitches this idea of a six part mini series on the nation of Islam. And the hate that hate produced um, is essentially the introduction of the nation of Islam to mainstream white America and its title kind of gives away what its thesis is that the rise that white racism has produced the rise of the antithesis or the sort of um, alter ego, which is black racism or what they call black supremacy. And it, it sort of um, does a couple of things at once. One is it provides white liberals with this um, sense of solve uh, that they, they are, racism is not distinct to white people. It's something that black people can do too. Um, and then secondly, it's also sort of terrifying to them. I mean, the, um, Malcolm would later talk about the hate that he produces having this kind of invasion from Mars, Orson Welles feel to it. It's a very sensationalist um, documentary that's supposed to frighten people about the rise of black nationalism or what they're calling black supremacy. Um, and one of the things that I 
argue in the book is that this narrative about the nation of Islam actually becomes a framework for white liberals to denounce and, and black liberals and a whole host of other people to denounce black nationalism throughout the 1960s. So this is a Google engram of the phrase black racism. And as you can see, this sort of point at which black racism even comes into being is really in 1959 around this documentary. And then with the rise of black power and groups like the Black Panthers, it suddenly becomes this very um, useful tool to denounce black nationalism, black revolutionary nationalism as nothing but um, black racism. So the Nation of Islam becomes um, talked about in this period as nothing but a sort of black KKK. And that's a, that's a um, understanding that is grounded within this documentary. The other thing that happens um, as an out an outgrowth of this documentary is that this religious scholar, C. Eric Lincoln, who's finishing his dissertation at the time um, at Boston University, pitches, um, he was just going to write a chapter about the Nation of Islam, but he sort of uses the popularity of that documentary to, um, to pitch to his, his committee this full-length academic study. And that study becomes the first academic book on the Nation of Islam, and it's called The Black Muslims in America. And part of the reason it's significant is because the phrase the black Muslims did not exist prior to this. So still to this day, people in the nation of Islam are often called black Muslims. But for, for Muslims in the nation, it didn't make any sense to be black Muslims because the whole theology of the nation is that all black people are, are Muslims, right? Islam is black people's natural religion. So what that phrase did, uh, however intentional or unintentional, it sort of plays into the state's argument that this is not Islam, that this is some sort of um, deviant form of Islam that is um, characterized by black Muslims, right? And then it's also simultaneously sort of outside of the civil rights movement, which is coded as, as Christian, right? Sort of within the vernacular of the black church. Um, so just to give you a sense of how the rhetoric, the sort of intersection, um, this is what Tuad Abdul um, Beer talks about as the, the um, burden of state, the double burden of state violence um, by Muslims of African descent, that on one hand, they're sort of framed through the, the um, rhetoric of terrorists. This is a 1963 um, article in a right-wing journal called Law and Order. You can see that there, this is literally on the other side of the page from um, advertisements to buy a submachine gun. Um, and then on the other hand, this Saturday Evening Post, also from 1963, notably co-authored by Alex Haley at the time that he's working on the autobiography of Malcolm X called Black Merchants of Hate. So there's this kind of dual um, framework here in which uh, Muslims in the nation of Islam are both sort of being targeted due to anti-blackness and also Islamophobia and the rhetoric around both of those things and the intersection of those. Um, so I'll close with this last bit about um, this trial and this letter. So the reason that Bratcher is writing to Malcolm X in the first place is to um, ask Malcolm X to be the sort of key witness in this trial of Sumerian v. McGinnis. So Bratcher's sense is that if the state is going to try to discredit the nation standing within the Muslim world and say that it's a hate group, that he should have Malcolm X come and testify. And I love this phrase that he has at the end, for the fighting man cannot win a war without the moral support of the home front, because I think it really um, captures the sort of relationship then as now between outside and inside organizing the necessary components of both. And what winds up happening is Malcolm X does testify for two full days um, in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he, he testifies for as long as anyone else in the trial um, as an expert witness. The, the person who the state brings also testifies for two days. He's a Columbia University professor of Islamic jurisprudence. And unfortunately for him and for the state, Malcolm testifies first. So Malcolm has already been sort of testifying before this um, actually quite conservative white judge for two days who's absolutely smitten with Malcolm. Um, at one point he starts apologizing to Malcolm because he's, he's using the word Negro and Malcolm says, we, we prefer American black man. So he starts using American black man and apologizing to Malcolm. Um, and then by the time this university, uh, this Columbia University professor comes up and tries to sort of trot out all of his honorary degrees, the judge says, I think it's you know, too soon to actually qualify you as sort of an expert on Islam. Um, 
So the outcome of this trial is not necessarily everything that the Nation of Islam wants, but it sets the, it lays the groundwork for a case that's considered sort of the Brown v. Board of the, of the prisoners' rights movement, which is Cooper v. Pate in 1964. And that's a case that's um, filed by an incarcerated Muslim in Illinois. Uh, and it, for the first time, sort of irrefutably establishes the constitutional right of incarcerated people and opens up this whole host of um, opportunities for prison litigation, which um, gets sort of violently shut in 1994 by the Prison Litigation Reform Act, the PLRA. Um, so we can kind of talk about that maybe if we get into the legacies. Um, but I feel like I've been talking to a completely quiet uh, space now. So I'm gonna stop and uh, open it up and have a discussion with Anu. All right, thanks a lot, Garrett. Um, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Uh, also, before I uh, get started on questions, I just wanna thank Critical Resistance for, for hosting this and surely for the organizing work that you and the, the staff and volunteers have done to make this happen. And congratulations on the book, Garrett. It's really, really exciting. Um, so one of the objectives of, of your book is to expand the boundaries of how we think about the Black Freedom Movement. And in particular, also to kind of imagine, uh, to reimagine how we think about politics, right? How, what counts as political activity and who we understand as political actors. Um, so let me start with a specific example from your book, uh, and maybe you could use that as a springboard um, to, to talk a little bit. So in your book, as you mentioned, you write about prayer as a kind of embodied form of, of resistance or protest. Um, so if we think about this a little bit, I mean, what do you, what do you think it means to think about prayer in that sense as political or as political activity in the kind of context that you're outlining it? Um, and how does this, or how might this change the way that we think about politics? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I mean, I, I think I struggled with this a lot because I felt like, for a while I felt like I was um, sort of mirroring the state's arguments in a sense that I was assigning political value to faith. And, and I was worried that I was sort of reproducing the state narrative about, so the state would say, this is actually not a religious group. It's a hate group that's using, that's a su sort of subversive hate group that's using faith as a guise to hide its, you know, political. So obviously not the same argument, but I worried that I was sort of imputing politics onto things that were not political. Mm -hmm. And what I realized were a couple of things. One is that we have this, uh, you know, Western division between church and state that makes us think about politics and, and religion as disconnected. And, and clearly that just doesn't work as a framework for understanding what the nation of Islam was doing, right? Like it, it was, it's politics and it's religion were completely intertwined and separating those things was, was nonsensical. Um, two is sort of like, the, the way that we completely understand King as political and religious and that those make all the sense in the world. And then even when we talk about Malcolm, it's still sort of like a, an emphasis on Islam, an emphasis on he was moving toward, we still kind of bifurcate the two. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, there's sort of the Western concept of dividing pol politics and religion. And then another added layer when we get into outside the Judeo Christian tradition. Um, but the, the thing that I also realized about it was that, and it's, it's kind of an obvious, like all epiphanies, it's really obvious, it's that politics is not an inherent, there's nothing inherent about politics, right? It's contextual, it's contingent. Mm -hmm. So there were all these things that are, are, that are, you know, like there's nothing about prayer that's inherently political. There's nothing about ablution that's inherently political or refusing pork right? The, but in the context of prison repression, those became intensely political. So to throw away pork was to throw away state food and be punished for throwing away state property. Um, to practice ablution in the morning was to be put in solitary confinement for, you know, waking people up. To um, pray under surveillance is obviously very different. I mean, they're praying in response to surveillance. So, you know, it made me think a lot about um, Robin Kelly's great article about the riddle of the zoot suit and Malcolm X and sort of saying like, 
look, the context in which Malcolm wore the zoot suit rendered it political. He's wearing this big flowing outfit in the context of wartime rations on, clothes, on textiles. He is sort of wearing the conch in solidarity or in reference to pachucos who are getting beat up by the cops in LA. So, so I think the main thing was that, that we have to understand politics as not sort of being like a, a, an essential thing, but a contingent contextual thing. And, and that when prayer is done and, and just all sorts of things in prison, right, become political through the intense repression of the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really, really useful for me. Um, and it kind of, you know, reminds me of um, one of the things that I find personally is so powerful and important about your book uh, is that it prioritizes um, the political agency and also the social capacity of incarcerated people, right? And that's kind of, you know, evidenced by the, the photograph, the surveillance photograph that you, that you showed early on in the presentation. And I think this is especially important in this, in this moment um, because it challenges what I, what I would read as a kind of prevailing tendency in anti-prison discourse to kind of view the prison primarily as a kind of dehumanizing institution uh, that produces social death and robs incarcerated people of agency and capacity. Uh, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to contest that argument. I'm just trying to kind of point to, um, you know, what's at stake when that becomes the kind of sole context in which we read the prison and how I think your book actually challenges it, right? I mean, I think the part of the problem with the framework that I'm talking about, the kind of dehumanization framework or the kind of insistent focus on social death is that it basically expresses the fantasy of prison administrators, right? I mean, after all, it's the ultimate goal of prison discipline to, to try to negate the social and political activity or capacity of incarcerated people. Um, so with this in mind, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about solitary confinement. Um, you know, solitary confinement, both, you know, it's, it's generally thought of, and I think rightfully so, as the kind of culmination of the prison's capacity to inflict social death um, and to dehumanize. Um, and your book looks at the use of solitary confinement by incarcerated people as a strategy of organized resistance. And you know, it seems to me that this asks us to rethink how we think about power, domination, and resistance behind bars. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I again, kind of an obvious point, but like the, the space that is the most repressed is always going to be this sort of contested space, right? So like, again, not thinking of those spaces as, as simply an annihilation of self and politics, but actually like mm -hmm. a, a sort of focus point. Um, I mean, Sastre um, writes this incredibly powerful piece um, called The New Prisoner after the Attica Rebellion of 19... 71. Um, he's incarcerated at Auburn in the time, at the time. And he talks about prisons as training camps for revolutionary forces. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know that rhetoric from, from the work you do too, right? So people are thinking about prisons um, as sites of training for guerrilla warfare, not as solely sites of sort of objection and um, dehumanization and annihilation in that way. So I think that to me, is a, is a helpful, I mean, I'm just sort of taking the terms on which they're thinking about these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I also sort of was thinking about, um, you know, that Audre Lorde quote that I think it's misrepresented often about the sort of dismantling the master's house with the master's tools. Um, certainly, I mean, all of us to some extent are using the, the master's tools in a, you know, racial capitalistic society, but especially people in, in prison, right? You don't have tools that are not the master's tools. And the, and I think this is the misreading of that quote. It's, she's talking about sort of giving up the ground rhetorically to sort of engage on those mm -hmm. terms. It's not about the actual tools that you're fighting with. Um, Cause I think there's all these ways that incarcerated people are fighting with tools like solitary confinement, right? Like appropriating the space of solitary um, and thinking about, well, what does the prison want that space to do? And, and how can we undermine that, fundamentally undermine it? So it's not the, necessarily the tool, it's sort of like 
not giving into the discourse, um, mm -hmm. right? Not giving the ground to the discourse and fighting on their terms, but rather using tools and fighting on your own rhetorical terrain. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, and, and they do that, I mean, across the board, it's not just solitary. So like the other thing that the Nation of Islam does is use the court system in that way. Like I remember when I started this project, um, some people kind of characterizing, well, like they're just asking for religious rights, you know, like that's not abolition. They're just asking for constitutional rights to freedom of religion. And on the face of it, that's true. But when you start to think about kind of infra politics and like the way, you know, part of it was testimony. Like they were using the courts as a space to go and testify to these conditions in the absence of other forms of that. Um, so it's, it was never just about you know, gaining access to the Quran or um, not being put in solitary confinement for practice of Islam. Like those were sort of, the courts were a staging ground for a form of, of politics and testimony. So I think if we just kind of read these things at face value, it often, um, you know, sort of re almost reinforces the power of the state to determine what those spaces can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm actually, I and mean, that's a really, really useful answer. And I'm glad that you kind of uh, brought up what I think you, did you say misappro the misappropriation of, um, or the strange appropriation of the Audre Lord quote. Uh, there's something, there's something that's to me that's almost off by, by in even saying, in even making the claim that there is such a thing as the master's tools, because the master didn't build those tools, right? The slave actually, built those tools that we call the master's tools, right? It's the outcome of, of a kind of collected activity that's generated from the bottom up. Um, uh, so I have a question for you about the title of your book. Um, and this is a question, again, a lot of these questions are very specific to kind of my concerns, um, right? The title, Those Who Know uh, Don't Say. I think it's a really provocative title, especially if you consider the fact that today we seem to live in a world where speech is often conflated with politics, where speech is often thought of as a kind of a substitute for political activity. And um, I'm particularly interested in this because my own work as you know, Garrett, is about the way the black voice, like the black voice has been constructed and enlisted as a way to legitimize oppressive social conditions under racial capitalism, right? Whether it's the way the black voice is um, been used to provide evidence for black criminality or whether uh, or the way in which the black freedom movement has been enlisted constantly as a form of testimony on behalf of American exceptionalism. Um, this is the context where I'm thinking about the title of your book and um, it's the title seems to point to the idea of silence or opacity as a kind of political strategy. Uh, on the part of the Nation of Islam. So I was hoping you could talk about this more. Where does the title come from? What are some of its implications? How do people understand this phrase? Yeah, thanks for asking about the title because I had to fight for that title. Um, <laughs> the, the editors were just like, no one knows what this means. I was like, that's the point. Then I get to talk about <laughs> it and they're like, no, that's not how you sell books. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, the phrase, those who know don't say is the first half of a longer phrase that um, Muslims in the nation would give when people asked about their political participation. So if a journalist said like, you know, is the nation of Islam a political organization? Those, they would say, those who know don't say, and those who say don't know. And it's a very typical sort of like NOI move. It's, it's you know, a riddle. It actually says something to those who understand while confusing those people who don't understand. I mean, there's this layered sort of political discourse happening of like speaking on multiple levels. Um, so I was drawn to the first half of that phrase when I started this project, because to me it captured, I, I was trying to figure out basically how this, um, organization that I felt like shaped all sorts of, um, aspects of the black freedom struggle in the mid 20th century had been almost completely written out of, of the literature. If you took a class from the civil rights movement and, and no one ever talked about the nation except for maybe Malcolm on one day, no one would bat an eye, right? Um, you could read a whole sort of narrative history of the civil rights movement, and again, only Malcolm shows up and it's fine. So I was just trying to figure out like, well, how does that happen? And I think the answer was in a sense, taking the nation at its word, 
like when the nation says, you know, like, well, no, we don't engage in politics. People mm. are like, oh yeah, no, they, they don't vote. <laughs> they're against voting, they're against the nation state. And it's like this very, I mean, one, it gets to this sort of understanding of like, what is politics? Like if we only understand politics as, you know, voter registration drives, sit-ins, again, that even that breaks down because they're doing sit-ins, they're just doing them in, in prisons, right? There's this very, you start to see like the shallowness of, uh, or the constrictions of what we see as legible activism within the movement. Um, do we see a hunger strike as politics? I mean, yeah, right? Do we see um, the examples that I started with of, of praying under surveillance as politics? I think so, right? Like, how do you not see that as politics? Um, so that's what I was trying to get at. And I guess the thing that I came to appreciate as the book became more about the carceral state and more about the surveillance and, and the thing that I kind of talked about of this like whole framework for misunderstanding the nation of Islam is that the second half of that phrase was equally important. Those who say don't know. So it wasn't just that the NOI was strategically silent about its politics. It was that simultaneously, there was a whole host of academics, journalists, and law enforcement, especially, who were sort of constructing ways of knowing the nation of Islam mm -hmm. um, as a hate group, as outside Orthodox Islam, as violent, as all of these different things. And those, the combination of those two things of kind of a, a misinformed master narrative and a strategic silence got us to the point that I was beginning this project and saying, well, how is this organization that's so deeply political outside of our, our outside of our narratives? Um, so to get to your question, I mean, I think it's the lesson there for me is like, it, it isn't just, it can't just be about the politics you say out loud, right? Because when do you say those, you know, we should be thinking about who we say our politics to, when we say, it. I mean, to me, it was about how the nation moved, not how, how they, what they said their politics were. Um, because they would say different things in all sorts of situations. I mean, they would say that they were religious when they were trying to rent a hall um, for a gathering. And then they, the hall would say, well, we don't allow religious movements. And they'd say, we're a business. We're going to have a bazaar. And all we're doing is selling goods, right? So then they would suddenly rent this space that could not be rented to religious or political movements as a bazaar because they would say, we're the Afro-Asian Business Association. And it's like, you have to take the time to understand the context in which they're sort of moving in this way. Um, and then, I mean, there's this, uh, I'll, I'll kind of end with this anecdote. Um, one of my good friends and comrades, uh, Zahir Ali, who writes about the Nation of Islam, specifically in Brooklyn and New York, he talks about, you know, we always talk about the Black nation building as like a demand for states in the Black Belt South. Um, a kind of like land base. And he talks about urban black nationalism, about how basically the nation of Islam saw urban black nationalism, not as, as sort of purchasing land and controlling, but like businesses, like he maps out and he says like, look, here's where they had the dry clean. And then here's where the luncheonette was. And then here's where the mosque was. And he shows this whole sort of world of Harlem and Captain Joseph literally said, like, we have Harlem wrapped up. And he's saying this in the 50s. And that whole world could be sort of illegible to folks mm -hmm. if they didn't actually understand what was going on. But to people in the nation, they understood that that whole radius was a controlled space. They policed that area. They ran the businesses in that area. Everything had to go through them. So I think there's just this whole subscript of politics that is much more important than what we're sort of saying we're doing. Like, what are we actually doing and how are we moving strategically and saying different things to different people rather than out there sort of like wearing it on our sleeve as a, um, as a, as a political identity, right? It's not, your political identity doesn't mean shit. What are you doing? How are you doing it? How are you moving? How are you effective? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. That was long-winded. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's really, really useful and, and interesting. And I, this might be a good time to kind of um, maybe pivot a little bit to think about um, to think about politics and activism. And I mean, I was hoping and I don't know, you could I don't know how you're going to how you want to approach this question, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you see the relationship between intellectual work and activism. 
um, from your own experience or given your own experience as an abolitionist scholar and activist? And I ask this question because in my experience as an educator, both on the inside and the outside, uh, there's often a tendency for students who are aspiring activists um, to think of study and activism as two separate things, right? When we're doing one thing, we're not doing the other. When we're doing the other, we're not doing that thing, right? So there's, um, you know, you're either reading a book, you're organizing, you're either theorizing, you're practicing, um, you know, you're either talking about history or making history. And uh, the dichotomy tends to privilege doing over thinking, um, you know, of course. So uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how you see that relationship, just given your own your own experience and the work that you do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in the classroom and in your research and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, as you know, I'm very passionate about this false dichotomy, so I'm glad you asked it. Um, yeah, I mean, the people I go back to for this is, of course, the, the Boggses, right? Um, and mm -hmm. it was funny because I was just teaching Stephen Ward's uh, biography of um, James and uh, um, Grace Lee Boggs and one of my students asked this question of like well you know how do we make sense of like their kind of revolutionary rhetoric and then on the other hand like they're mostly just talking about ideas and I was like well what what does a revolution without ideas look like like it's not good I don't know. I don't, you know, it doesn't. So, and, and Jimmy, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he's got, you know, that great quote that's like, um, ideas are life and death. So we ought to struggle over them. Um, and the other person who uh, just, it came to my mind when you asked that question is um, Adrian Marie Brown, who also kind of comes from that same tradition of the Boggses, um, recently saw her speak and she said, you know, like she's talking about the importance of imagination and visioning and, and this idea that we are living in someone else's imagination. Like someone imagined this shit we're living in right now, you know? And, and that's powerful to reflect on that. Like we didn't just get here by accident or like people's failed political programs. This is someone's not failed, you know, this is someone's successful political program that we're living in, right? And this is someone's actual imagination of what the world should look like. So we have to be imagining the world we want to live in and that comes through study and and study i think for me is about community building right like the the idea that you can that you would study without community building i mean that's just higher ed um right <laughs> that's what we're in um which brings me to my other point which maybe is contradictory but i i don't like the idea that like because you study social movements you're somehow an activist. Like if I just went in and taught about the nation of Islam, that's not activism. Um, and I think that the reason I think that um, is because of the, the sort of neoliberalization and privatization, you know, the, the commodification of higher ed. So like the way, the setting in which I'm teaching that is so commodified about like students sort of earning these grades and, and the, the transactional nature of that, that's not activism. I can talk about the most revolutionary radical ideas and that's not activism. Um, I can have a radical study group that does not, that has a completely different orientation to study that I think is all about ideas, community building, revolution. Um, so it's not about, it's not about study or it's not about like books, right? That makes it mm -hmm. sort of one or the other. It's about the, the context of it. One is transactional and corporatized. The other is sort of, um, you know, radical community oriented. Um, and, you know, I just, I guess I'll close by saying I'm reading um, Johanna Fernandez's book on the Young Lords right now, finally getting around to that. Um, I guess it just came out a couple months ago, but like I immediately beat myself up if I haven't read this book that I've been waiting 10 years to read. Um, and there's this great line in there where this, so the Young Lords, you know, sort of like come together they launch this program and they're like, all right, they're reading, you know, Fanon and they're thinking about guerrilla warfare and they go into the community and they start talking to like grandmothers in, in El Barrio and they're like, what, are, what do we need? And they're like, garbage, we need garbage pickup. And they're like, shit, okay, well, but we're reading like Mao and Fanon. So basically what they do is they're reading Mao and Fanon and doing garbage pickup. And that's their revolutionary program is they're serving the needs of the community and doing political education. And 
to me, that's always the framework. It's like, how are you serving your community? How are you getting people involved in everyday struggle? And how along the way are you thinking about creating the world that you want to live in? And neither of those, you know, he, um, one of the activists uses this metaphor of like the hammer and nail. Like if you just, um, you know, read about building a house, but never sat down with some hammer and nails, like you would have no idea how to build a house. But the reverse is true as well, right? Like if you handed me hammer and nails, I'm not going to build a house. I'm just going to hammer a nail into a board and give up. So, so like we have to understand that those things are complementary all the time and both are necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Shirley, how are we doing on time in terms of the Q and A and, and uh, I don't know if it's time to open things up. I have more questions and ideas, but uh, yeah. Um, I think maybe one more question and then we can open it up um, to the floor because I can see we already have a couple really good questions or uh, clarifications in the queue. Cool. So, yeah, one more question I think sounds good. Cool. Well, I was, I was um, this is a kind of related question to what you're talking about. And um, let's say I, I think. Well, some of the most, I think some of the, some of the most innovative and, and um, you know, influential abolitionist thinkers and organizers uh, in my reading have insists that, you know, one of the, one of the main challenges for anti-prison work is actually to decenture the prison from our conceptual frameworks. Um, and that might sound counterintuitive to a lot of people for abolitionists, you know, for people, people who group resistance, it won't sound counterintuitive. But I mean, I'm, I think this idea is best captured in Ruthie Gilmore's phrase that the prison is not a building over there, but it's a set of relationships. Um, we can also think about um, the idea that abolition isn't so much the Im elimination of prisons, but kind of building of a world that doesn't need, that doesn't you know, have prisons, doesn't want prisons. Um, so I'm curious, you know, this is a question that I like to ask to, you know, a lot of people that are, that are both, that are scholars and activists, um, and people that are really passionately involved and, and passionately focused on how to make the lives of incarcerated people and their communities better, while also doing abolitionist work that is thinking kind of broadly, right? So I wonder how you yourself balance the imperative to think about the prison as a set of relationships on one hand with the work that you do in and around actual prisons specifically on the other hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been working through this for the last couple of years and thinking about, um, you know, the proximity I think should be to incarcerated people right? Like that's who we should be organizing with incarcerated people. We should not be necessarily organizing around and against prisons. Like that, 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 I mean, we should, but that, that can't just be that the proximity is really to the people who are incarcerated, not to the structure. And that's, that's the way that we're sort of attending to the structures that create the prison rather than thinking about the enemy as mm -hmm. the, as the concrete and the walls and the bars and the, you know, um, so mm -hmm. that, I think that's the kind of constant in my work is I'm not, you know, I'm thinking about how do we get people free. Um, but I, we can't only be thinking about getting people free because the point is about building people's political capacities, right? Like they, they will get themselves free if we can build their political capacity and resources enough. It's not about um, sort of advocating on behalf of people in that way that I think we sometimes get stuck in. Um, mm -hmm. it's about building political capa capacity and power for people who are incarcerated and have been incarcerated um, to do that work. And that's different from, I think, if you, if you kind of follow the tendency of all of these different topics at that kind of wind up in liberal reform land, um, like bail reform spiraling into, um, you know, a set risk assessments or, um, the body cameras or elect, uh, electronic surveillance or all of these different things. Um, it's, it's all because we're focusing on sort of turn, how do we turn this thing and change the contours of this thing into something else. That's what we get stuck 
rather than thinking about how do we shrink the capacity of this structure and build up alternative structures. Like, I think we can actually learn something from the success of the right here in terms of shrinking, like they have, they didn't think how can we rebuild the social welfare state? They were like, how can we drain and suck that thing until there's nothing left? And we're gonna build up this carceral state and in, 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 out of that state surplus. Um, so the point is to like, is to shrink the capacity, not to change the mechanism of it somehow. Like it's not just about changing bail to look like a different form of bail or policing to look like a different form of policing. It's to shrink the capacity of those things to, to do what, what those people want them to do. Um, and the way to do that is in proximity to the people who are most vulnerable and who are um, the most knowledgeable about doing that. Mm -hmm. I guess that's mm -hmm. kind of where I fall on that. Mm -hmm. So building the, building the capacities of incarcerated people is precisely one, one method um, by which one kind of thinks about the prison in the world and think, thinks about um, how to, how one might be able to remake a world that does not have prisons, right? Doesn't need prisons, doesn't rely upon prisons. Um, that's, a really, that's a really useful formulation. Yeah, I mean, it's not to say that we're not thinking about just destroying prisons, right? Mm -hmm. But like the way that we get to destroying prisons is about building political capacity of people who are in them. It's mm -hmm. not by sort of looking at the structure of the prison and trying to figure out how to, you know, design it differently or how to, um, you know, rework um, the different mechanisms of the prison into something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I might be bifurcating these two things, but I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to sort of make what? the point that you're making, which is is that I, I think the the notion of being in proximal to people rather than structures. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, kind of, and, and that that kind of, you know, one of the things that this does is it is it helps us, you know, again think beyond that other false dichotomy, reform and abolition, that everyone yeah. is kind of always yeah. done up. Oh, maybe we maybe we should open up some other questions. Yeah, thanks for the questions, Anu. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you both. Um, this has been very gripping and enlightening, to say the least. Um, so I am actually going to pass it off to Kate just for a couple minutes to ask a couple questions on behalf of CR Portland um, to think about all of these discussions in the Portland abolitionist framework. So Kate, take it away with the first couple questions. Yeah, so first I wanted to ask something that like I am personally curious about, but just kind of broadly, what are some um, like lessons and lineages from the revolutionary work of the Nation of Islam during the civil rights era that you see movement work um, still carrying on? And what are some lessons you would like to see people use more and some things that might've been lost through that time, time passing? That's a great question. Um, I mean, one really like tangible anecdote, just um, I was, so one of the figures that I talked about, Martin Sastre, um, um, the next project is I, I wanna write a political biography of Sastre. Um, and I was chatting with um, an incarcerated organizer who many of you may know, Stevie Wilson in Pennsylvania. And I sort of said like, oh, do you know about Martin? And he was like, oh yeah, through his dean um, by someone who was incarcerated with Martin and, and Martin introduced him to anarchism. Um, so there's this really like tangible connection, uh, I think just within the black radical tradition inside between the nation's work and Martin's work. Um, because you know, Stevie and I have been thinking a lot about um, zines as ways to kind of translate some of the, this kind of work that gets um, siloed in academia, mm -hmm. um, get it into prisons in different ways and different forms that are more accessible and less censored. Um, so that was just this kind of eye-opening, um, tangible connection between the nation's work um, over just like a generation or two of incarcerated folks who are kind of passing that on as oral tradition. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, 
I mentioned the PLRA earlier, like that, the PLRA has been devastating to the ability of incarcerated people to sort of advocate through legal channels on their own. Um, so I think that's one of the, I mean, it was one of the 2018 prison strike demands to rescind the PLRA. Um, so I think, you know, that has, that is a, a legacy of the Nation of Islam specifically, the, the sort of wide opening of possibility for prison litigation and then the narrowing of that through the PLRA. So I think um, that's something we need to continue to fight to rescind is, the, is that um, piece of legislation. Um, I guess the other legacy is um, the one that I talked about in that quote of sort of the fighting man on the, you know, needing the, the home front support. I mean, that has just been a through line of all um, prison organizing and abolition work over time is that there always has to be connectivity and responsiveness between outside and inside. Like there's no other way that this works um, without deep connection. Um, and I think, and, and respect for that relationship. Um, so I encourage everyone to, you know, I mean, I think people, probably not on this call, because it's, you know, a CR call, so people are engaged in anti-prison work, but if you're not, there's like this sense of, um, like, how do I get involved in this? And I think it's just such a simple answer, which is like, start communicating with people inside and asking what they want. That's it, you know, because that's the, that's the foundation on which all of this rests. So um, I think people sort of build it up into this feeling of like they, they just have no idea how to get involved. And it's like, well, everyone needs support. Everyone needs commissary. Everyone needs money on their books and someone to write to. And, and just encouraging people to kind of take that first step into the work. Because that's, I mean, that's how all of us probably came into this work at some level, right? Is going into a prison or writing someone. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, another question that came up is, um, could you share about some ways of how liberalism challenged the organizing and activism of the Nation of Islam? And in what ways are those present today? And what, what lessons can current abolitionist organizers learn about that type of um, specific repression and co-optation that can happen? That's a good question. Um, I mean, there was certainly like, in some ways, the thing that the nation was up against more than um, than the right was liberalism, right? Like the the in that 1959 documentary, "The Hate That Hate Produced," what they what Mike Wallace and Little Lomax produced was liberal civil rights figureheads like Roy Wilkins to come in and say, "This is nothing but." the flip side of segregation, right? This is, they want segregation, just like George Wallace wants segregation, um, with no sort of understanding or will to understand the difference between segregation and separation. Like that's what the nation is talking about is willful sort of racial separation and power and community control, um, which is different from segregation, which is forced upon. So, I mean, the, the sort of history of the nation of Islam is the struggle against liberalism in many ways. I mean, it's what Malcolm's constantly calling out in the North is like the, in the metaphor of the fox and the wolf. It's about like, I'd rather be going up against the wolf who will tell you where they stand than this liberal fox who's, you know, saying one thing, doing another. Um, so I think in some ways, the Nation of Islam and, and um, the tradition of Black nationalism gives us tons of insight into the trappings and um, ways that liberalism stunts revolutionary movements. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we've kind of touched upon the ways in which today, um, yeah, through these kind of, this false dichotomy of reform and abolition, um, the way that people of, you know, I guess liberal politics, I don't know what you call Van Jones, but the sort of co-optation of, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a set of, uh, a sort of movement, I mean, this gets back to that question about, that Anu posed about um, silence and voice, right? Like who's speaking on behalf of the movement? How are they moving? What are they promoting? Who's listening to them? Yeah, cool. Yeah, um, one question that came in through the chat was um, asking to talk more about um, 
tactical and experimental jailhouse lawyering and um, that process through the nation and um, questions about the strategy and um, how that was a tactic used to gain power. Say that last part, how that was. A strategy used to oh. uh, gain power. Yeah, I mean, I think um, like a lot of this work, it's about understanding the context in which it was used. So like to jailhouse lawyering in particular had this um, tremendous potency because you're talking about a period in which incarcerated people don't have constitutional rights. So on one hand, it's about gaining constitutional rights. On the other hand, it's about using um, avenues to, like I said, to testify in court to all sorts of things um, that they didn't necessarily have um, access to. I mean, that is, that is, again, a through line in prison organizing is people inside do not have access to outside outlets. I mean, now we have some that did not exist then, certainly. Um, but using the courts as something more than just a place of legal wrangling, but actually like a, a place to kind of stage um, protest and to testify. Um, in terms of creative, I mean, one of the th things that I kind of, I mean, I don't want to overblow it, but there, there's a sense in that era um, in which the carceral state is, I guess this is still true. I'd have to work this through. But there's these moments where it's like, working at complete odds so like at the state level they're trying to push they're trying to um squash jailhouse lawyering and prison litigation and then at the um prison level they're like this is a pain in our ass so we're gonna like set them up in a mimeograph room where they can like churn out writs all day so it's like you see these officials who aren't communicating about they're just trying to solve their own problems so at the state level they're like we have th this is flooding the courts and like clogging up the works and at the prison level they're just like we can't have a notary republic or no, notary republic, notary public here every day. Like we just need to get them set up in this room. So they're like churning them out. And then the state's like, why are they all coming here? And it's because the prison's actually facilitating it. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that's different from today, but I think it's actually not. I mean, I think there's all sorts of ways in which these idiots are doing stuff that's like counterintuitive. Um, and I think maybe we could do a better job actually of exploiting that. Like they share a set of logics and rhetorics, but they're, they're you know, as you know, they're not really um, a disciplined lot who are sort of thinking things through. Yeah. Um, and then kind of a comment came on that I'm interested to hear you both talk about, um, but looking at the university as a participant in the carceral project um, and how you both feel as being abolitionists in, a, an educational setting, uh, particularly the university, and um, what the university's role is in reproducing um, carceral, the carceral state. Um, yeah, I'm glad I saw that comment pop up. Absolutely, 100%. Um, the, I mean, this was a point that I made at the Mumi conference about the university is a driver of mass incarceration. It produces logics. That support it. It produces, uh, you know, rhetoric and discourse and studies. Um, at the University of Mississippi, um, we have, I mean, this is, Mississippi is great because it's just like so brazen sometimes you don't have to like really spell it out. So we have a center on campus for the study of um, Southern journalism and politics named the Overby Center. And Charles Overby for the last 15 years has been the president of the board of Core Civic. Um, formerly CCA. So on my own campus, we have a named building uh, that was started with a $5 million donation. Um, and he's, he's made millions and millions of dollars off of um, private prisons. So there's also that level of just sort of um, profiting off the carceral state. And, you know, I tried to blow the top off that and people here were just like, I mean, he, it, we, we had students planted at a, a Q&A and they said, you know, called him out on it. And he said, I'm proud of the work we do. And people were like, yeah, it's a good business. They're reforming. I mean, it was just like, we don't have the, the mobilization here and the kind of student organizing to actually make it a thing. So it just continues. But um, I guess the irony of that was that I was going around doing FOIA requests to see where the university was invested. And then someone was like, you know, that building's funded by the president of the board of course civic. And I was like, fuck. 
that's such a Mississippi story. Like, why am I doing FOIA requests? <laughs> I just built a center. Yeah. I don't know, Anoop, do you have thoughts about how fucked up the university is? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, we could talk about, we could, we could actually, you know, build a, a whole inventory here on just on the ways in which the contemporary neoliberal privatized university is, is um, a driver of mass incarceration, com complicit in a, an entire system that, that relies and depends upon on prisons. Um, it's work that I'm interested in, that, 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 I, that I study and I'm writing about as well. Um, one of the things to, to, that I'll just kind of say about that is, um, is in thinking about uh, the way in which the university is kind of involved in a society that depends upon mass criminalization is partly through the kind of dominant assumption that tends to be shared amongst liberals that there's something um, opposition, that, that, that the university and the prison stand on kind of opposite sides of the kind of political coin, right? That, um, that you know, I mean, you know, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, you know, talk about this in the other comments, right? When they, when they kind of criticize the, um, the, the kind of the well-meaning slogan of universities, not jails, right? Um, they kind of make the point that what if more universities means actually more jails? Um, and I think it's really useful to think about that because it's precisely the kind of the, the common sense opposition that we make about the, the university being the space of inclusion, presumably the space of inclusion, diversity, freedom of inquiry, all that stuff, whereas the prison is this place of kind of like repression, exclusion. It's all these assumptions that are so built into the, to the kind of dominant anti-prison discourse um, that we kind of need to step aside from and we need to kind of deconstruct in a sense. When it comes to people that are actually, you know, either faculty or graduate students or TAs or students that, you know, whose work is in the university and um, that's just kind of part of what, what they do, it's part of what we do, I think, you know, the most important thing is not necessarily to kind of study all the ways that the university is complicit, but simply to kind of be, um, to, to acknowledge the, the simple fact that being involved in prison work in university, that there's nothing inherently radical or progressive about it, right? That, that kind of, at least acknowledging that and incorporating that into your kind of practice, um, and into your kind of conceptual frameworks, that's a really important thing to do that anybody, for anybody that is involved in, 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 in kind of university prison work, because you know, the solution isn't to just stop doing the work or to be like, oh, fuck the university, you know, as much as people want to do that. Um, I don't think that's actually very productive, um, but yeah. Totally, thank you. I'm gonna try the, one of the Q, answer live Q and A ones. Okay. Um... So there is a question that came in asking you to acknowledge and talk more about the work of Muslims and liberation movements, independence movements, both behind walls and outside walls, other than the NOA, like the work of Dar UI Islam, as an example. Um, no, I, I, I would just be full of shit if I tried to answer that question, but I appreciate the question. Um, I just, in particular, studied the Nation of Islam's prison organizing. Um, Shirley, did you have any questions? Those are all the ones so far from... Yeah, um, in the chat, um, Garrett, could you repeat the name of the case that, um, Malcolm X testified for two days on? Yeah, um, here, I'll write it in the chat, so it's more, it's Sumerian v. McGinnis, um, and then the one, uh, that I mentioned that's sort of the Brown v. Board case is Cooper v. Pate. Got it. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so what has been the response from the Nation of Islam and those that um, were incarcerated to, um, yeah, what has been the response to your book? And does the nation see itself as a vanguard of the prisoners' rights movement? Those are great questions. Um, I mean, there's no sort of like uniform response, like, you know, Louis Farrakhan hasn't said like, here's how I feel about Garrett Felber's book. Um, 
<laughs> but I, I did, I mean, uh, I did an interview last week with um, Imam Alfred Muhammad um, that I can share. Um, he joined the nation in 1960 um, and was really, I mean, we, we mostly spent the time talking shit about Alex Haley and Lou Lomax. And I mean, I think his sort of, um, you know, he was like, thank you for taking the nation seriously and not seeing this as a deviant, you know, social deviance, basically, like social deviant theory. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think certainly it's sort of the thing of, to your question about um, whether the nation saw itself at the vanguard of prison organizing. Um, I mean, they're not, certainly in the period I'm talking about, they're not considering themselves abolitionists. Like they're not actually ever saying, you know, there should be no prisons. Um, but there is this kind of widespread sense, even outside the NOI, that people are like, oh, yeah, no, the nation was in prisons before many other movements, that they were, you know, the foundation on which the prisoners' rights movement, it, it was just this sort of common sense that no one um, or few people had kind of taken the time to parse out. Like, I think Malcolm X has stood in so long for, like, evidence of the nation in prisons. Um, so I think part of it has just been about sort of documenting, um, you know, archivally, like what, what does that mean? What does it mean that the nation has been in, inside prison since World War II, right? And that that decision, the reason the nation has a presence in prisons is related to draft resistance and, and you know, refusing to go to war in World War II. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of the extent to which I've had what you could call like an official response or some response from the nation. Um, I did correspond briefly with Martin before he passed. Um, he shared some materials with me back in about 2014 um, and then had a stroke shortly thereafter and I sort of started corresponding with his wife. Um, he, he left the nation by the time Malcolm was killed uh, or around the time after Malcolm broke. But um, that was a relationship that I wish I had more time with. And for the rest of the folks that I write about, I was never able to locate any of them. I, they'd either passed or it was just hard to track them down. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, I don't think I see any other questions from the floor. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, it's never too late to post them. Um, yeah. Yes, please. Um, could you actually share a little bit of context and insight on the emergency committee? Um, and what aspects of that coalition should CR Portland um, or Care Not Cops to borrow or optimize? related to either anti-gang or police work organizing? Yes, thank you for asking about the, or the emergency committee. Um, so this was uh, a really, like, a coalition that lasted probably six months. Um, and really the work on the emergency committee probably in scholarship it, it could be encompassed in two paragraphs, most of which have said this coalition lasted six months. So I spent a chapter on it in part because I thought, you know, the, na the nature of coalitional work is that it's tenuous, it's fraught. That's the sort of, you, that's how you know you're, you know, the Bernice Reagan Johnson quote of like, you know, you're in a coalition. Um, I, I always mangle people's quotes, so I'm not gonna try it verbatim. Um, but that's how you know it's a coalition is because it's, it's sort of fraught. So this, this coalition comes um, together in 1961 in Harlem in response to police violence. And basically, um, A. Philip Randolph, longtime left labor organizer, um, calls together this coalition. And it's got, on one hand, um, sort of liberal civil rights figures like Anna Arnold Hedgemond. Um, it's, it's got, you know, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, um, and then this group of black nationalists like Malcolm X and Louis Michaud and Porkchop Davis. And um, what happens is they sort of form these subcommittees and one of them is on police brutality. And what I talk about in the book is how the subcommittee on police brutality, which includes Malcolm X and some of the other black nationalists, 
um, becomes very quickly the law and order committee. Um, and, you know, why it's important to think about the difference between a police brutality committee and a law and order committee, because they have fundamentally sort of different premises about who's at fault for police violence um, or the relationship between police and community. Um, so anyway, that chapter is, you know, looking at this very brief, tenuous um, coalition in part to say um, that's the nature of coalition work, in part to say when you form a coalition to address police brutality and suddenly subsume it or see it transformed into this discourse of law and order, that that's um, part of the reason this falls apart. And I guess finally to say that um, the nation of Islam, which is also often portrayed as kind of um, outside of the movement, right? Or like casting aspersions from the sidelines, like the way that Malcolm gets written about at the nation of at the nation of Islam, the March on Washington, which is organized by Rustin and Randolph and others, is that he's off on the sidelines, unable to participate because the nation of Islam doesn't, you know, participate in politics in this way. Um, and so part of that chapter is to say like, well, he's organized with Rustin and Randolph on the local level. And part of the reason the nation's not participating is because they're opposed to some of the fundamental decisions that the March on Washington has made. And that we need to understand that it's not about, you know, um, organizations just standing aside, that there are like real relationships and real fundamental challenges and differences of opinion. Um, so I don't know, in terms of translating that to coalition work. Um, I mean, I just feel like the lesson there is really about, hey, Anna. Um, yeah, just about um, understanding that coalition work is always in that tenuous space. Um, and yeah, I don't know <laughs> beyond that, if I'm answering your question. Yeah, that, that definitely got to the meat of it. Cool. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, I see another question in the chat. So please discuss the history and current integration of state repression against Muslims on all levels from local Department of Corrections, feds, Homeland Security, et cetera. Oh shit, that's a heavy hitter. Um, that, that is, yep. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can find it. Please discuss history and current integration of state repression against Muslims on all levels. Um, Okay, well, I don't know if I can do all of that. Um, I can say that um, part of what I was trying to do with this book was un sort of shift away from this um, mainstream narrative of Islamophobia as kind of a post 9-11 phenomenon, um, the emergence of, I mean, clearly there is a, a sort of epoch changing moment in the rise of the security state after 9-11, but it's certainly building on logics um, an Islamophobic and anti-Black discourse that's connected um, since the post-war period. So that was part of what I was trying to get at. Um, I think another legacy certainly is this um, Black identity extremist formation. Uh, again, people were sort of, when the BIE report got leaked, um, linking it back to Cointelpro. But again, that's that was a later iteration of the sort of surveillance state that was um, infiltrating the nation of Islam beginning in the 1940s, uh, or even earlier, really, in Detroit in the 30s. Um, and that sort of framework of Black identity extremism, you can see the correlation to what I talked about earlier, right, of the hate that hate produced, of Black nationalism as being an example of kind of Black hate or reverse racism, that that, that sort of rhetorical framework goes back to the Cold War. Um, and even in, in, if you recall, I write about this in the epilogue about um, the Dallas police shootings when there was a sudden jump um, on uh, one of the men had X as his um, middle initial. And there were all these linkages to the Nation of Islam. And it just turns out that his middle name was Xavier, right? But they, it was, they were able to sort of capitalize on the way that people um, in the media would immediately latch on to um, this discourse. And I guess the final piece of that, um, back to that point about how um, the second half of the title, that those who say don't know, um, groups like Southern Poverty Law Center still classify the Nation of Islam as a hate group um, in their sort of, and, and I think it, it kind of 
to this day allows us to have this, um, allows this liberal framework of being the other side of the American Nazi party or the KKK is the Nation of Islam because the SPLC still classifies these groups um, because of their alleged anti-Semitism as hate groups. So that sort of enables then the FBI to make these claims about black identity extremism. So that's something I talk about in the epilogue of this book a little bit is about the way that liberal think tanks and law enforcement, just like um, the sort of assemblage of C. Eric Lincoln um, and William Parker in, in Los Angeles, the police chief, those sort of same alliances exist today between law enforcement and, and liberal think tanks and academics. Sorry, I didn't answer that whole question. That was a, a biggie, but a good one. I thought that was, a, yeah. that was an excellent response to that okay. question. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I um, am going to ask a quick question of you, Anoop, um, and then I'll go back to the last question I see in the chat. Um, could you expand a little bit on the notion of Black exceptionalism within the uh, Black Voices framework that you spoke about a little bit earlier? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so, I'm, so I, I guess uh, I'm drawing upon kind of, you know, partly my own work and partly kind of like the work of somebody like Nikhil Singh in Black as a Country when he kind of, um, you know, and, and in some of his work since then, when he's trying to make the argument uh, very compellingly and convincingly, I think, um, that uh, the, that the for, I mean, he's not so concerned with the question of voice, but what he's arguing is that the Black Freedom Movement has been consistently enlisted as a, um, kind of the narrative of it has been conscripted to kind of um, not simply to rationalize, but to express the kind of core of, of US social relations and democratic relations as being ultimately democratic and freedom loving. And so one of the things he does is um, talk about the way that, uh, that, um, that during the Bush administration, uh, Condoleezza Rice, for example, was consistently kind of deployed and even, you know, did, did so herself to kind of talk about um, her own history growing up in, in the Jim Crow South uh, and coming out of that and getting into the, the, the Bush administration as being kind of um, the, the, the kind of empirical evidence for what makes the U.S. war in Iraq and, and, and the war on terror in general as being a kind of um, uh, an extension of the legacy of the Black Freedom Movement. And so, you know, I, I kind of point to that um, as kind of one of the many, many ways in which the Black voice is being, it has been constructed for a very long time um, in order to kind of, um, to, 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 to justify, to rationalize, to kind of, uh, to provide a kind of support for racial capitalism. Um, and so, and my own work is, is, is thinking about how this plays out in, um, in, 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 with prisoners' voices specifically, that the prisoners' voice, uh, after, specifically after Attica um, in the early 1970s, gets kind of gets deployed on a kind of framework of blackness that emerges out of um, 19th century notions of uh, the enslaved voice and that kind of thing. So that, the prison, so that prison literature, for example, can come to be seen in a way as kind of a legacy of uh, the slave narrative and the way in which that kind of has, has you know, in, in, in ways that a lot of people haven't really seen serve to reinforce a notion of freedom under neoliberalism. So that's kind of like, you know, I guess a long way of answering that question, but that's how I, I think about the relationship between my own work on the construction of the black voice and on the work uh, that, that Nikhil Singh has done. And, and even more recently, Kiangi Amata Taylor's work in, um, in For Black Lives Matter, The Black of Liberation. On, on the way in which blackness is being used as a kind of, in a kind of multicultural fashion to, uh, to reify and rationalize American empire. Like how Clarence Thomas uh, cites Malcolm X as his, Cl Clarence Thomas is the, the forebearer of Malcolm X, right, of his generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, okay. And then maybe one last question from the chat, and then we can um, keep things moving along. So what public schools in the U.S. teach Malcolm's and the Nation of Islam's history? Can you say it one more time? Yeah. What public schools in the U.S. teach Malcolm's and the Nation of Islam's history? I'm not sure if that's university. Like K through 12, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, don't, I feel like I, my answer is just not enough. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to reframe it kind of in terms of like when I, so I didn't read the autobiography of Malcolm X until um, late college. I think it was my senior year. So I never was, and I'd be curious actually about everyone um, on the call, like when you first encounter um, Malcolm, because I didn't get Malcolm in, in high school at all. Um, I have a friend, Russell, in Arizona. Shout out to Russell if he's on this call. He's a high school educator who does a lot with Malcolm um, in Arizona. So I know that for a fact. He's doing good work there. Um, and, you know, if, and if, certainly if Malcolm does get taught, right, it's always as the foil to King, right? It's like, you know, it goes back to the good Muslim, bad Muslim, Muslim framing, but also the sort of good civil rights, bad black power framing. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's not just a problem of when Malcolm and the nation get taught, but how, um, and I would say in most cases, I mean, this was kind of the substance of, um, that conversation with Imam Alfred Muhammad was like, there's just at the university level and K through 12, an unwillingness to, um, to take the nation seriously, to think about it in a contextual grounded way. And one of the other things that we talked about is people's, unlike, I mean, maybe it's just because I study the nation, but I feel like there's so many, um, unlike other things where people will sort of say like, no, I just don't know anything about that. People think they know the nation. Like if you start talking about the nation of Islam, you will find random folks who are like, oh, no, 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 I know about the nation of Islam. Like, let me tell you about it um, in, in ways that are very um, ungrounded or based on the autobiography of Malcolm X alone. So I think... Um, that's how I'd answer that question. It's just that it's not, it's not just a sort of lack of teaching about it, but also of really engaging with the material, engaging outside of the autobiography, because the autobiography is ultimately a, it's a memoir, and it's a co-authored memoir by someone who, on one hand, Alex Haley, was hostile to Black nationalism and the Nation of Islam. So if your only introduction to the organization is through the autobiography, I think there's a lot of other ways to kind of... Um, engaged. And, you know, I would say, if people are interested, just start with Malcolm's speeches. There's a lot on YouTube, there's some free, um, long PDFs, hundreds of pages of Malcolm's speeches. Um, and I think that's a better representation than the autobiography. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you, Garrett and Anoop for that amazing discussion. Thanks to Kate, who is a CR Portland member, if I did not mention that before. Um, and Garrett, I think I'm going to pass it to you to just talk about um, your engagement with CR a little bit. And as I do that, I am going to pull up the link to your book um, on CR's website right now, and I'll pop that in the chat. Um, everyone, if you enjoyed what you heard here today, please, please, please buy this book. Um, I am very, very excited to read it um, in its entirety right now. So yeah, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, sorry, you, you cut out briefly. So what is my what is my task here in closing this out? <laughs> oh, um, just a, a quick minute about your engagement with CR and oh, just yeah. kind of the importance of um, the work that we're trying to do together. Yes, glad to do that. Sorry. Um, no, I'm just thrilled. Um, so we sort of, this event came out of my desire to, um, in some ways, you know, like in, in thinking about how to tie this book to tangible um, prison abolition work, um, CR, PDX in particular came to mind. Um, that relationship that for me began with um, Liberation Literacy, which I mentioned, which is this abolitionist collective um, that um, began really out of I mean, to our earlier point about um, the university. So it began out of this model of incar inside out, um, of having incarcerated students study with college students. But since I didn't have any college students as a grad student, we started this 
um, kind of mixed group radical reading group. Um, so anyway, that sort of led to, um, as we mentioned, this coalitional work that CR does with, with Live Lit. Um, for folks who don't know, CR does amazing work uh, around the country, been in the, in the game for a long time, um, just celebrated 20 years, right? Um, yeah, a little over 20 years. Over 20 years. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to um, Kate and Anna to talk about like conditions on the ground, what's happening in Portland in terms of um, decarceration efforts, the coalitional work with Care Not Cops and all of that. And, um, and all the money um, for the books and, and donations all go to support that work. So thank you everyone who's um, contributed. So I can start talking a little bit. So yeah, like Shirley said, I'm Kate. I use her pronouns. I'm a member of the Portland chapter of Critical Resistance. Um, we've been around for over six years now um, doing abolitionist, abolitionist work in Portland. Um, we do a lot of events like these, um, getting people together to think and talk and learn. We've also been um, a a core and a steering member of the Care Not Cops Coalition for over three years now. And we've had a male program running for, I think, four or five years, like a long time. Um, one of the main ways people can get involved right now are through the Care Not Cops campaign and the male program. I'm going to speak more to the male program because that's what I'm more involved in. Um, but uh, we usually hold monthly in-person letter writing nights. Um, the third Monday of the month. Right now, um, we're in a period of like figuring out how to keep the robust mail program and make sure all the people we write to inside and the people we're in communication with and the people who rely on us for resources, political education, and um, br more broadly, connection and um, political engagement are still getting that, especially at this time of crisis. Um, so we're setting up a way to get letters scanned and emailed to you. If you want to do that, please email us at um, crpdx at criticalresistance.org. Um, if someone could type that in the chat, that'd be awesome. Um, if you're already on our um, email list or your Facebook, you'll be getting an email about that soon. But like Garrett said, like if you're not sure where to start, please like absolutely start with talking to people who are incarcerated right now. And the CR mail program is a great way to do that. I know some people on this call are not in Portland, but at least for the time being, it'll be more accessible to write to people in Oregon and Washington, um, even if you're not here, because we're gonna be doing things digitally for a while. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna pass it to Anna to talk about the work that um, Karen Cops has been doing around COVID response stuff. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm with Critical Resistance um, and have been with Care Not Cops since 2017. Um, so Care Not Cops is um, an anti-policing campaign in Portland, and for the past year, um, the goal has been to dismantle the gun violence reduction team, which is the gang policing unit of the Portland Police Bureau. Um, so much of our work has been to push the city to stop increases to the Portland Police Bureau budget and divest from the gun violence reduction team and instead invest um, those funds into community resources. Um, right now, um, our demands are focused on decarceration um, and housing for all and opposing criminalization and policing around COVID, um, particularly with the stay at home order. Um, and so we wrote a letter with 13 um, demands um, in these with, with the more specific um, uh, decarceration demands. Um, and we also named the impacts of policing, particularly for youth who are perceived by police as gang affiliated, especially with the schools being closed right now. Um, so we would normally be mobilizing in person to city council meetings and things like that, but since we can't do that right now, we're, uh, we've been um, doing a phone zap for the, past, uh, for the past week or two weeks. Um, and this past week, we've been making calls um, to city council and um, county commissioners and the sheriff's office and the mayor and the governor um, with these demands. Um, and this letter with all these demands was, um, we have 20, um, over 20 organizations at this point signed on. 
Um, so um, I would encourage everybody to um, join this phones app and continue to help us call um, and make sure that these demands are, we keep pushing for them um, because we have seen that there has been um, some decarceration specifically of like jails and pretrial detention. Um, people or folks in pretrial detention and they are currently also um, citing um, folks instead of um, booking them. So um, I think this is a great opportunity to keep pushing for decarceration and ending um, policing and um, opposing criminalization around this. So carenotcops.org has um, the demands listed. You can find more information, their phone numbers um, for people to call. There's also emails um, if uh, the phone, uh, if their voicemails are not or if they're full. Um, and also uh, Instagram, we have Care Not Cops PDX um, as a place you can go to to check out um, our demands and also information for the phones app. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've been up to recently um, and we hope you'll uh, help out and join us. All right, um, I think that's it for us today. I'm going to close us out here. Um, thank you so, so much, Garrett and Anoop, uh, for being part of this amazing discussion today and giving us all a lot to think about. Um, yeah, everyone, you have links to the book. You have CR Portland's email address. You have a link to the Care Not Cop site. And like Anna mentioned, um, CR Portland is on Facebook and Care Not Cops is on Instagram. So please check out all of that social media um, and look into the great work that Garrett and Anoop and CR Portland are all doing. Um, Garrett and Anoop, any last takeaways before we head out? I would just thank you for moderating, Shirley. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it and organizing us. Yeah, yeah thank you no so problem. much. Thank you all. Um, all right. And with that, everyone be as well as you can. Um, I hope you and your loved ones are all doing as okay as possible right now. And hopefully we can all engage with you again soon.